Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this fourth session of the Merie Annual Forum 2008, uh, a session on the EU in the Middle East, responsive state building to prevent violent extremism. My name is uh, Morten Bøås. I'm a research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, and I would first start to acknowledge that we are very happy to be here and would like to thank uh, Mary and uh, Laver Alalden for uh, the very fruitful co collaboration between our two institutes, and also to thank um, Mary for its contribution to one of the projects that forms the backbone of this particular session, and that's a project that we call EU Unpack. It's a project where we, uh, where we critically have tried to examine the effectiveness of the EU's crisis response mechanisms. So I'd very much like to acknowledge the, pro uh, the project and also acknowledge the um, generous support by the European Commission through the Horizon 2020 uh, project in this regard. As I said, my name is Morten Bøås, research professor at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. With me today uh, are uh, Raman Blekua, the European Union ambassador to Iraq, Stephen Blockmans, uh, um, uh, Professor Stephen Blockmans from the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. My friend and good colleague uh, Tine Gade, which is a senior uh, researcher also at NUPI, and Kamran Mohammad, uh, a research fellow at Mary. And just to kick us off, preventing radicalization is obviously important. And that's a challenge everywhere. This we, uh, this we have seen in the case of the Middle East. We see, currently see it in, in Africa, in the case of the Sahel, North Africa. But we've also seen it in Europe. Preventing violent extremist radicalization is difficult. It's, it's not easy any places. But of course, it becomes particularly challenging when you're trying to, do, to achieve this in, an, uh, in areas which can be characterized, characterized as areas of weak and or limited statehood. And if we then include that we, have, we do not necessarily have a very good understanding of the underlying causes of rad radicalization, this becomes difficult. So if we are to prevent, we also need to understand why this is taking place. That's the only way we can come up with good and efficient policies that actually work. In order to do this, I think we at least also need to touch upon not only religious issues, but also on larger livelihood crises, issues concerning enormous youth bulges and youth unemployment, youth underemployment, population growth, and climate change effects which together has led some people to give up the very idea of the modern state and seek answers elsewhere. So in many ways we could see the, what we are currently seeing in parts of the world, including parts of the Middle East and North Africa, is in some ways the making of a perfect storm, making weak states even more fragile. This is the challenge that we are confronted with and we must work towards avoiding. If we are to assist in state building processes, including in the Middle East, we also need to take in a couple of dilemmas, particularly if we are working in fragile states and fragile political environments. Obviously, these states are in a dire need of external assistance. But we also need to realize that these states is where it will be most difficult to get such assistance to work. The combination of weak, but also sometimes also illegitimate governments, what this gives in combination is a very low absorption capacity. And this is difficult. So the answer to preventing radicalization in these kind of environments is not necessarily to spend more money, but to spend money better and wiser. Because just pepper bombing these places with resources will not necessarily help, because the administrative capacity to make use 
of that kind of uh, external assistance may at times be very low. And our role and the role of the European Union must be to assist. The international, uh, international community cannot build the states of these countries. We should have, and uh, this is a dream that the international community should stop dreaming, basically. This has been proven in the case of Afghanistan. I think it has been proven in the case of Iraq. It will be proven in the case of Libya and so on and so forth. The international community cannot build states for other people. It's the people of Iraq, it's the people of Iraqi Kurdistan, it's the people of Afghanistan, of Libya and so on, who needs to build their own states. The question is if we can come, become better at framing policies that enable us to assist local processes better. And this is difficult enough, but it's even more difficult if we have to deal with one of the most basic elements of all state building processes. And that is, that is if what that is missing is the crucial agreement on the polity, on the composition of the polity. Basically, countries lacking an agreement about who belongs and who do, who do not belong. Because that means that you are confronted with an immensely fragmented political, ethnically, socially, religious field. So can we become better at facilitating I mean, in the EU NPAC project, we have, uh, we have discussed a number of factors that we think is important, and I'm not going to go through all of them here, because then we will be sitting here until uh, midnight, and I don't think that any of you really fancy that. But let me just flesh out a few. One is sort of more focus on real analysis and local knowledge would help, and particularly how to understanding how to identify real root causes of conflict. And if this is to take place, it is our suggestion that the EU, both in its policy framing and analytical work, needs to be able to become much more bottom-up in its approach, that it's a real uptake of experiences from the field, and that not everything is based on mandate and doctrine of policy development in Brussels. We need to become better at understanding also the causes of radicalization and what can be done to, pre to prevent. We are also suggesting that one way of doing this is to achieve a much better uh, balance in the whole international community between security and development. We need to see that sustainable stability, which is precisely what Europe uh, wants and needs in the Middle East, in North Africa and, and the Sahel cannot be found in only supporting regimes whose both development motivation and general legitimacy can be, be questions. And we need to also see that we need to broaden out from very narrow security tractions. With that and with those challenges, I would like to kick it over to Ambassador Ramon, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Morten. Well, you have thrown some very interesting ideas on the floor, and I would like to pick some of them up and, and build on them. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the EU and effectiveness together. I think uh, <clears throat> that's a very, uh, a very interesting point, because sometimes uh, Within even the European system, there's some doubts about how effective is, is uh, how effective are our instruments, how effective are our policies. If, uh, and we have been criticized for being sometimes too naive or, or unrealistic in our expectations. But uh, I think our engagement in the region in general and in Iraq in particular comes from a very clear uh, realization or awareness that our security does not start in our borders. Our security starts here. And it's the prosperity and the stability of our neighbors that will guarantee our security. I think uh, there's been a, a significant transformation in recent years uh, of 
the role of the European Union and uh, the strategies and the objectives that lead our actions. And I will advise you to go to one document that, uh, and don't, don't be worried, normally I know European Union strategy documents uh, are considered to be too boring, too long, too imprecise, too wishful thinking. But I think the global strategy that was um, presented by High Representative Federica Mogherini in 2016, accompanied by a, a new consensus for development, are two key uh, documents that really explain what we are doing and why we are doing it. I think um, conflict resolution and crisis management is one of those objectives and coming from the realization the world is becoming more divided, more dangerous, less predictable. Um, I think that we have now at our disposal also new instruments that correspond to those objectives. Uh, the European Union has, of course, its classic development and uh, emergency uh, cooperation uh, instruments, ECO and DEFCO, and it has added to it uh, the foreign policy instruments, what we call instruments contributing to stability and peace, a much more flexible uh, funding mechanism to address precisely uh, situations of crisis. We also have the Iraq strategy presented in January last year, uh, sorry, in, in January this year, <laughs> I'm already moving ahead, and uh, the entry into force of the uh, partnership and cooperation agreement with Iraq. So we have evolved from a reactive mode uh, in the strategy for Iraq and Syria to confront ISIL to a much more proactive and forward-looking. So what are we facing now? What are our challenges? Obviously, the collapse of the post-colonial order that uh, emerged from the demise or, or the uh, uh, division of the Ottoman Empire and that coincided practically with the 100th anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement is, is a defining uh, watershed. And uh, that has the implosion uh, of some uh, state institutions in, in, in many countries of the region has brought again forward a different uh, set of identities that have replaced the binary confrontation or, or polarization between Arab nationalism normally associated with socialist ideology with uh, the most traditional conservative uh, position that was defended by mostly the uh, monarchic uh, systems. So now we have uh, tribal identity, ethnic identity, sectarian identity becoming uh, much more relevant. Sometimes I think exaggerated to a certain extent. And this is coupled by, I would say, three main challenges that have not been yet incorporated or integrated into the political systems uh, of the region and in the existing regional order. I think it starts with the Shia awakening. Uh, it goes on with the, the Sunni frustration and anger at uh, feeling um, at the receiving end of the international uh, and regional order and also the Kurds' demands for more political empowerment in countries of the region. So um, that also now is coupled with the risk of uh, wider regional confrontation. We have a different situation in which the old approach to isolated conflicts that could be dealt with separately is not valid anymore. And I think conflicts as distant as Libya, Yemen, Somalia, Lebanon, Syria, or Iraq at, this point, at a certain point in time cannot be isolated. And if you relate this to the growing tensions that are on the rise in the region, and that are increasing significantly after 
the withdrawal of the US from the GCPOA. And the uh, coalescing of two coalitions, opposing coalitions, uh, the anti-Iranian coalition on one hand and the, what we call the so-called axis of resistance on the other one, we are basically coming to a point that is not very different from the Europe of 1914 before World War I. To which extent these conflicts can actually uh, provoke a regional meltdown or a regional conflict, time will tell and our actions also will uh, determine or uh, have an influence on, on the way, on the way this, this is played. But certainly, uh, I think the risk exists. And so what is special about Iraq? I think Iraq has moved or evolved from being what you could call the Pandora's box of the Middle East, where all evil was coming from. Wars and ISIL uh, and all sorts of uh, sectarian strife from being a political laboratory uh, in which all these three elements I mentioned actually are integrated to some extent in the political system. So you can say to a certain extent that Iraq could become a model for the region in terms of how is possible to integrate those elements, diffuse a certain degree of conflict, and find different cooperative uh, political arrangements. And I think the government formation process we have been uh, witnessing is, is a good example of, of that. So as in Pandora's box, after all evils have come out of the box, then hope was at the bottom of the box. So may that be a good omen for the future. I think that uh, what the European Union is now trying to do in Iraq is basically uh, create a partnership in which we can support the process of reforms, in which we can contribute to consensus building, we can uh, become a partner in uh, the process of reconstruction of uh, development and in the hopeful new social contract that uh, uh, Dr. Adel Abdel Mahdi uh, has uh, mentioned as uh, the ultimate goal. And I will leave it there because I think uh, there's a, a good opportunity then for debate, so I will not uh, keep throwing stones in the, in the pond. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, from your perspective, from a Brussels perspective, uh, SEP's perspective, how does this look? I, I would care to emphasize the fact that I'm based in Brussels itself and that my main object of fascination is the European Union looking out. And the internal political dynamics, of course, which together forge EU foreign policy, percolating up from the different member states with their own uh, tensions, as we've seen them play out, especially over the migration crisis, coming into this pressure cooker of Brussels, which, is, you know, which has its own institutional logic, then projecting its foreign policy uh, through its EU delegations and, uh, and sponsored projects, of course, on the, on the ground. That is, I think, my... Um, the vantage point at which I, I observe things. I would like to maybe uh, make four key points and draw on the empirical findings which have been gathered through intensive field research, not just in Iraq, uh, but also in the other case countries in which uh, the UNPAC project worked. Um, they include uh, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Libya, Mali, and Ukraine. And whereas each of these conflicts, of course, have their own dynamics and their own uh, idiosyncrasies, and whereas every comparison is fraught with difficulties, I think there are nevertheless common lines which can be synthesized out of this empirical research. But my starting point is, is violent extremism, um, and, um, which of course affects local communities, as we've been able to, to observe but also generates negative shocks internationally. And the ambassador referred to that. Basically, the internal, external security dialectic of the European Union has 
um, has been blurring. Those boundaries which existed have been blurring um, quite rapidly um, over the last couple of years, um, where indeed the EU has a key interest in uh, peace and stability in its surrounding uh, uh, regions, driven by supply chains of evil uh, that we've been able to, to witness. Uh, one would be, of course, very prominently um, you know, exposed by the phenomenon of foreign fighters, that is, EU citizens getting battle-hardened um, in uh, Iraq, in Syria, and traveling back, and uh, as I was on the metro in Brussels at the moment in March when, uh, when the bomb went off, um, exposing you know, danger to citizens within, uh, within Europe. So that's, that security, of course, comes, uh, security to the homeland is, is internally meshed uh, with, uh, with external uh, security. Uh, second point is that, well, you referred to it very briefly as far as the EU strategy on Iraq is concerned, and there's much more to be said, of course, but violent extremism um, is, and the prevention thereof, or the countering thereof, is, is, has become part and parcel of the EU's policies and programs in, uh, in the six countries that, uh, that we have studied is an important objective, in fact, of uh, EU external action. But it should be observed that the EU, as an international organization above and beyond the member states, only has a supporting role, simply because it is left incompetent to a large extent to act by the very member states that make up the European Union. They have their own security, internal and external strategies, which they implement, uh, partially in parallel and at times, of course, through the European Union. Now, there where the European Union is competent to act and has been developing strategies is in, in particular on the internal security side, where we have strong coordination mechanisms and networks, uh, EU counterterrorism SAR, um, various instruments, but where on the external side you see it far less developed. The objectives are there. They are now identified, and I, I think there are probably four, and Morton uh, already referred to them. One is indeed better understanding um, and tackling the root causes of violent extremism, which requires deeper analysis, conflict analysis, deeper knowledge about local dynamics, and Tina and Cameron will talk about that um, later. Two, capacity building, not just of the state, but also in order to obtain sustainable development of sub-state actors and non-state actors. Three, strengthening vulnerable communities. Uh, again, going uh, quite local by emphasizing through different projects and programs, socioeconomic inclusion, um, justice, access to justice, and what has become a key word in EU lingo Resilience, creating resilience, the ability basically of a state but also society to absorb shocks and as Teflon almost to bounce back to the status quo ante in a way, which is a marked difference in terms of EU interventionist policies abroad from the type of stabilization um, missions and actions that the European Union um, implemented uh, before. And the fourth would be, of course, enhancing uh, those preventive and, and counter, uh, counter uh, capacities for violent extremism uh, by emboldening civil society, but also the media um, in, in, um, in, in providing proper information and, um, and, and dispelling lies and disinformation. Now, these four objectives um, are, I think, and you, you mentioned it, Ambassador, indicative of a new and perhaps higher level of ambition um, of EU action to address instability um, more strategically, in a way, going beyond the operational crisis response and trying to marry the, the political, the economic and, um, and economic dimensions to EU external action in a much more sequenced and integrated fashion. This is, in a way, the whole of government type of approach that has been spearheaded in several EU member states, Britain at first, uh, a couple of uh, Nordic and Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, 
um, and to a lesser extent, I should add, Germany and, uh, and France. Here again, the buzzword is resilience. This is everything about the European Union these days in addressing uh, external conflicts and crises is resilience. And I do want to put two markers down here, and those will be my final points, uh, Martin. One would be a positive one, perhaps, and a second slightly more critical. The positive is, of course, that the EU, through its resilience um, approach, tries to enter into the conflict prevention, conflict response and resolution game much more upstream, or should I say local. And that is ultimately where the solutions have been found in order to, uh, to prevent more, cost, um, more costly action uh, and perhaps more ineffective uh, otherwise. But the second is more critical, as I mentioned. Um, this is the, the policy talk, resilience, integrated approach, etc. And while you see this transformation indeed in policy documents, and you mentioned the EU global strategy, the consensus for development, there is a strategic approach to external conflicts and crises, and resilience in particular, um, which is all about more systemic action on, on behalf of the EU family, if you want, EU institutions, agencies, and member states. I think there are nevertheless, at least on the basis of our empirical research in the countries that I mentioned, four challenges that the EU faces, and I will leave you with those, and maybe that, that provides um, uh, some food for discussion. One is the, the perennial question of donor coordination. The EU, in fact, has more or less discarded its effective multilateralism concept, which characterized this, the European security strategy of 2003. It's still there, it has a different wording, um, but the EU itself is of course, known to be a difficult actor to forge a common position. Internally, it has difficulties at achieving effective multilateralism. You have to come to an agreement between 28 member states, institutions, etc. And that means that the EU often enters theater, well, second or third in line. And that puts it on the, on the back foot, if you want, in, in order uh, to have its own principles and interests safeguarded in effective multilateralism in donor coordination on the ground. I think that's the first point. The second is local ownership. You have the EU coming in, and of course it, uh, it will have, uh, as you do on a daily basis, um, will have consulted with, uh, with local actors, um, but who is the local in this, uh, in this respect? Is it the government in Baghdad? Is it, you know, is it the, the one here? How deep do you go in order to be, to be able to address those issues? And how flexible is the EU to actually depart from its preset um, rationale in international crisis response once it does? Third point, conflict sensitivity or insensitivity, perhaps, of the EU, which goes hand in hand with the previous point. Um, driven by internal politics, with increasingly populist parties gaining the power of government in a host of member states, it becomes increasingly difficult, of course, to depart from uh, a more hard-nosed, real politic type of way, um, which puts the European Union a bit out of sync with its own integrated approach because migration and the externalization of border management basically uh, trumps most of the other concerns. And the final point, the fourth point, Martin, it may put the European Union out of sync with its own self-declared uh, respect for uh, fundamental rights and, uh, and freedoms. In fact, the EU global strategy introduces a term called principled pragmatism. Depends how you look at the term, I guess, uh, and where you put the emphasis. Principle at least comes first in the, in the concept. So the EU, whilst not going around with the wagging finger of a preacher anymore, um, comes across as a more realist, interest-driven actor, which I think is appreciated by counterparts. But of course, it also um, makes the European Union less credible 
to those local actors which, uh, whose uh, fundamental rights it, uh, it, it is out uh, to, uh, to protect or promote, um, when it is uh, pulled askew in that struggle for, uh, to balance idealism and realism, values versus interests. And I'll leave it there, Mort. Thank you, Stephen. And then we turn to Cameron, please. How does this look from um, a point of view of Iraq and Erbil? Thank you so much. Uh, actually, my presentation is different. It's not really uh, presenting a perspective of a certain actor. It's more an overview of the local context and local power dynamics and how these affect the study of violent extremism in the context of, of Iraq. First of all, um, I, will, I will explain the Iraqi context and then I will share some key preliminary findings of the projects I directly and indirectly involved with that address the study of violent extremism in Iraq, including the Kurdistan region. First of all, I mean, when we study the, this issue in this context, I mean, you cannot really come up with a, an easy generalizable finding and with a representative finding in the case of Iraq because the, the country is divided, the country is in different transitions, and the country is in different contexts. When we study the issue of violent extremism in Kurdistan, it's very different to the, to, to the Baghdad context and to the Mosul context. And this creates a serious challenge for researchers for us to come up with a representative finding that can form a national policy because in the end, violent extremism needs a national policy. The second is during the interviews and during the survey, I directly engage it. Uh, the Iraqi, including the KRG officials, do not, may, do not distinguish between terrorism and violent extremism. So when they approach uh, the two, they actually use the same concepts to explain the two different process. And theoretically, it's, it's difficult to define these two terms, terrorism and violent extremism. But when it comes to a policy, when it comes to an approach, there has to be a clear, straightforward, uh, two different approaches. And, and I have been involved in many projects. Still, the issue of violent extremism is more NGO-led initiatives. And rather, there is no uh, a national uh, comprehensive, serious policy by the government. It's more NGOs is trying to engage local communities because the community engagement is key to, to, to the, the, any approach that aims at preventing violent extremism. And again, an overview of the projects and studies conducted in Iraq, and I can I can uh, divide them into two different, uh, two different parts or two different approaches. One believes that uh, the, the drivers of violent extremism or what drives to violent extremism is the, is the, the very meaning of regional nation state or the, the, the nation states do not work in this context. So there are grievances uh, of communities that go beyond the the day-to-day, -day, you know, basic services. It's more it's challenging contesting contesting the the regional state order. And the second part or the second approach is really they believe that no, it's it's the issue of governance. It's the issue of the, an effective statehood. If governments and states in the region are able to provide basic services, is able to provide you know, local ownership, then we can prevent violent extremism in the long term. And the second part of my presentation, uh, key preliminary findings of the interviews and survey we conducted in the past months is, 
Uh, basically, there is low trust in security and political institutions in Iraq. And this, uh, it, th this number, when you try to come up with, with uh, numbers, it changes you know, in different parts of the country, but it's an overall problem, including in the Kurdistan region, the trust is very low. Uh, the low turnout in the Iraqi elections can be an indication to this decreasing uh, trust in both security and political institutions. And second is, uh, the, again, people feel that in the survey, people feel that they are excluded from the decision-making process, from uh, shaping their affairs, and without uh, a community engagement, we can, we can contain, we can defeat terrorism, but we cannot prevent, we cannot counter violent extremism. And feeling of uncertainty is, is everywhere. People are very uncertain about their future, about their identity, about their security. So extremists, violent extremists, and violent extremist groups try to provide certainty, uh, provide promises. In this context where there is no certainty, uh, extremists feel very uh, you know, emboldened, they enabled to uh, mobilize more people. Of course, there is no automatic uh, solution to the issue of uncertainty. It's a long-term process, but it is the key, the driver to that uh, enables an environment conducive to violent extremism. And I have seen many projects dealing with community policing, again, linked to community engagement. But again, in the context of Iraq, when there is no strong unified center, uh, community policing can be uh, also a driver for the militarization of, of communities. So, we need to be careful when we, when we engage communities, but also when it comes to uh, militarizing them. And again, the, uh, as we have explained it, countering terrorism is different from countering violent extremism. The first is more short-term, hard security, direct impact, uh, more top-down, but the, the second approach is more long-term, more community engagement, more whole of society in, uh, approach. But in, the, in this context where there are conflicts after conflicts, it's becoming very difficult to initiate with any long-term projects. And uh, here I'll just emphasize on the, the phase of stabilization. This concept introduced uh, mainly in Mosul uh, the stabilization phase in itself is defined as a from military centered point of view and, uh, and when you try to and the the lesson is for us is to really combine soft security with hard security because stabilization alone from military perspective can again contain terrorism but cannot uh, address the issue of violent extremism and it has to be time bound. It's, you cannot really uh, keep living with civilization for years. It needs to be short term and then open a space for more long term initiatives. And uh, one more finding, uh, it's more recommendation as well, is there is a serious gap between the researchers and, and NGOs with the policy makers. And there's, there, there's a, the lack of a line, language that both, both community understand. So and here I recommend that the international actors can play an important role in bringing these two communities together uh, that brings more community-based uh, recommendations with hard security elements uh, within the state, within the, the government. Again, it's a long-term uh, investment, but it's something that I, I see the, the, the impact, the significance of international actors in bringing these two communities 
uh, together. And uh, my final uh, finding during, during the research is, uh, again, uh, it, it's, it's, it's true that it's the issue of, 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 of a weak state within Iraq, but in the end, it needs a strong Erbil and Baghdad uh, engagement because most of the, we, we have looked into the numbers and the incidents, most of them happened in disputed territories in areas where both actors have leverage, influence, and power. So without this engagement uh, on the ground, we cannot really uh, address the, uh, we cannot re prevent violent extremism, mainly in Sunni majority areas, more specifically disputed territories. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron, and I think you did a very nice job at uh, pointing out uh, the, the importance of combining security and development with your uh, take on uh, hard and soft security, and I think that's uh, very much to the point, so thank you. But finally, Tina. What do you think? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Glavir uh, and Kamaran and the rest of the Medi team for hosting us. I'm involved in a new P project with uh, Meri, uh, looking at uh, hybrid pathways to resistance in the Islamic world. We compare Lebanon, Iraq, Mali, and Libya. And the question I will raise here today with you is, uh, can official Islamic institutions play a role in preventing violent extremism? So I'll look at the religious side of it. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Lebanon, and role lessons uh, for Iraq. So uh, as we know, Saudi Arabia and Morocco are both traditional monarchies built on Islam, and both were actually victims of uh, terrorist attacks at the same time in 2003-2004, and responded to, the, uh, to this by involving official Islamic institutions um, to prevent violent extremism. In Saudi Arabia, religious, the religious establishment uh, was involved in a program to rehabilitate uh, Saudi jihadists in jail. This was a program called uh, Munasiha, established by uh, Mohammed bin Nayef, interior minister at the, at the time, um, in 2003. And it, in this program that was quite particular, uh, Wahhabism uh, became used as a tool against extremism, defined as Rulu, meaning the Islamic uh, view of extremism, exaggeration, or inhiraf, deviance. Um, and uh, there was also focus on Wali al-Amr, um, the Salafi concept of uh, obedience to the ruler. So the jihadists were seen as unguided youths who needed patronage. So while this is a rehabilitation program, there was also a preventive program uh, launched uh, for the general public, um, and that also involved uh, the religious establishment. But after Daesh, we see actually a new trend. Um, new institutions are created to fight um, violent extremism outside the official religious institutions. One example is Eatidal, is a new center called, Glo uh, in English, Global Center for Combating Extremist Ideology. It was inaugurated in uh, Riyadh uh, during Trump, President Trump's visit in May 2017. And unlike the, the other project that I mentioned, this is actually based in the Ministry of Defense, meaning placed directly under Mohammed bin Salman, and it promotes uh, counter-narratives uh, online but that are not based on Islam, but rather on um, universal values such as human dignity. And instead of involving Saudi clerics, it has created an ideological council of Muslim scholars from uh, all over the Islamic world. And the Muslim World League, uh, that is Saudi controlled, is also part uh, of this. Uh, Mohammed Al Aisa, who is the head, he's part of this uh, Atidal. And um, we also see a shift in the way that the Muslim World League operates in Europe. As you might know, um, the, the, this institution has accepted to replace mosque imams uh, in Geneva and Brussels. And in Brussels, they actually gave the, the control of the great uh, mosque back to the Belgian authorities. But at the same time as we see this trend, we also see that uh, Saudi Arabia um, 
like Sheikh Ahmad Khali, for instance, is using Islamic uh, precepts to justify the wars in Yemen and Libya, and uh, the Saudi-led military coalition of Islamic countries against Daesh is also a coalition against Iran, which is absent from this coalition. So moving on to the Moroccan model, um, it's often argued to be best practice, but it's very difficult to reproduce because of the specificities of the Moroccan context. Um, the legitimacy of the state institutions, the state structure continued during colonialism, the monarch carried, uh, carries the title commander of the faithful, he controls the Habus uh, endowment ministry um, as a crown prerogative, and of course Morocco is known for the Maliki uh, Islamic tradition. Uh, Morocco has taken an inclusive approach to Salafism, pardoning Salafi jihadists on royal decrees, most recently in 2015, and many of those pardoned have established faith-based NGOs or Islamic schools, and they have, many of them have become close to Mahsin, um, or the regime. So this has also been possible only because Morocco has a history of inclusivity in the religious field. And in the wake of the 2003 Casablanca uh, attacks, uh, King Mohammed VI reformed the Islamic institutions and the curricula to uh, educate Islamic preachers, um, including more critical thinking, uh, modern uh, humanities subjects, and women could become religious guides. But the problem is, uh, of course, that this is not necessarily what the masses are asking for. So how can we create a popular Islam that is non-Salafi? Morocco has a problem, as you might know, of foreign fighters to Syria and Iraq. It's the, second, uh, it's the third largest Arab contingent after Tunisia and Saudi Arabia. Um, so, uh, Mohammed VI created uh, or gave motorcycles to state imams for them to be cooler, but uh, it, it seems it was uh, insufficient in the sense that Sufi movements are more popular than the official Islamic institutions and has following outside elite levels. Moving to Lebanon, it's a different case. Lebanon's um, official Islamic institutions um, are weak, unlike in Saudi Arabia and Morocco. They are weak and they only play a domestic policy role, of course. Lebanon is a receiver of Salafism exported from the outside. And the political competition in Lebanon be between uh, the Hariri movement or secular Sunni politicians and Hezbollah is a major driver of uh, religious radicalism in the sense that sometimes concessions are given to radical Salafi preachers for political means and official religious institutions are not happy about this because they are really sidelined and they are not the drivers of uh, radicalization. Uh, in addition to this, we see very poor recruitment to the religious institutions. The good students, they don't want to study Sharia because Sharia is not seen as prestigious. Mm, and the salaries of the imams uh, are really low, so the imams, they need to take uh, double sal or extra salaries from the politicians, uh, creating a problem of independence, of course. So more autonomy to Dar al-Fatwa and decentralization uh, is needed to enhance popular credibility, but it's not sure whether that would be enough. Uh, EU member states provide capacity building to very skilled people in Dar al-Fatwa who are willing to, uh, to take this role in uh, combating violent extremism. But the problem is that they face resistance from the Prime Minister's office, which wants to control religious institutions to obey the rules of uh, confessional politics in Lebanon. So uh, now I will move to the Iraq case. As we know, this is a very sensitive case. One third of the country just came out of a Daesh. How can uh, official Islamic institutions in Iraq provide education to youths who were ed educated uh, under Daesh for three years? It's not easy. So it's more a question for now about the short, short term, uh, extinguishing fires, than about building a long term project. So the lessons, I think, for the countries that I mentioned for Iraq is that, of course, unlike Morocco, for instance, Iraq doesn't have uh, a history of strong official religious institutions because they were dismantled under Saddam Hussein's uh, regime and then by the US-led invasion. There is also, like in all countries, the problem of political manipulation of religious institutions. Like in Al-Azhar in the 1950s, um, 
the institution was put under state control and it lost, lost popular credibility. So, of course, Iraq would want not to follow this example, but it would want uh, to become more, to have more autonomous uh, religious institutions. The image of Islamic religious institutions controlled by, uh, indirectly by Shia government is, of course, undesirable. And many Iraqi Sunni religious scholars, of course, they refuse to condemn Daesh at least parts of them. Uh, although they disagreed with Daesh, they refused to officially uh, denounce it or to take lead in the battle because of a failure of the Iraqi government to address root causes that led to Daesh, but also because these Islamic scholars, they see themselves as targeted by Daesh um, with, with reasons. And like in Lebanon, decentralization of its official Islamic institutions is needed for popular credibility, but the root causes of um, radicalization is not religion. And um, of course, radicalized individuals are not looking for a moder moderate Islam. They are already violent because of economic and political uh, frustrations, and uh, they are looking for specifically violent groups. And this is why uh, economic and political root causes must be addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tine. Um, before we open it up to the floor, I will see if we can have a little bit of uh, change between the various uh, panelists here. Uh, I think we had great presentations who covered a lot of ground. I mean, Ambassador, you were uh, moving from uh, 1914 and sleepwalkers as the reference point to the collapse of the post-colonial in the Middle East, to the Shia awakening, Sunni frustration and Kurdish demand for political space, and uh, ended up talking about, which I, uh, which I was quite curious about when you mentioned uh, Iraq as a political laboratory. Uh, personally, I, have, I work, work much more in North Africa, uh, Sahel, than in, the, than in the Middle East, and um, I often hear this uh, in Mali, uh, but that, then with very negative connotations from Malians who say that the EU and, uh, and the UN is treating Mali as a lab laboratory, but then it's, then it's in very negative connotations. But you had, I felt that you had also some positive connotations to it, so uh, maybe you would like to uh, expand. Stephen, I mean, you touched upon these uh, difficult issues of local ownership, conflict, uh, uh, sensitivity, supporting uh, resilience to local communities. Based on what you have seen from the fieldwork that comes out of EU UNPAC, is the, is the union as it's sort of set up today, is it really situated to do this? Uh, can it use echo funding much more strategically in this regard, for example. Uh, Cameron, you talked, uh, one thing I got out from you was, which is obvious but so often overlooked, and we see it time after time again, that one important driver of, if not initial radicalization, at least continued radicalization, is the response of state security forces. Maybe you could uh, elaborate a little bit on how this actually plays out in the case of Iraq. And Tina, finally, I mean, maybe you could sort of, I mean, the case of Morocco is much highlighted in the part of the world where I work more. And I mean, Malian imams are now sent for retraining uh, to, uh, to Morocco, for example. They, uh, <laughs> on return, uh, very few of them can get the mosque to, uh, to preach for. So I'm not certain how how successful this will be in the end, but still, I mean, there also seems, there is some simmering conversations in Morocco, in the various Muslim communities, that in fact, parts of this model could be useful. So what, what do you think about that particular aspect? But also feel free not to kick back on some of the other things that you have heard during the conversation. I think we start with you, Ambassador. When I, when I mention the Iraq as a political laboratory, I don't say, uh, I don't mean it in the sense that it's a European or uh, international laboratory uh, experimenting uh, in Iraq. I think uh, it is basically an Iraqi laboratory in the sense that many of the, of the issues have been actually uh, the result of the internal political dynamics. And I think, for example, when we talk about violent extremism, 
uh, sometimes we are developing a narrative that is very Eurocentric or very Western-centric on, on, on analyzing this as the beginning of a new Cold War in the region. Uh, well, I think um, those, those sometimes recipes we are developing, and many of these programs, and I, I agree with Stephen, uh, that a lot of our strategic, strategic documents and our programs mention this, you know, uh, the, the confronting radical extremism and, and, and this kind of thing. It's as if we had the solution for radical extremism, and radical extremism was something coming from the region. Well, actually, very often is the result of the opposite process. It's, uh, it's external interventions that uh, promote or, 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 or bring uh, violent extremism in the region. And I want to mention something that I think has not been sufficiently underlined. When Iraq was basically, when one third of the territory of Iraq was taken over by Daesh, a lot of people in the West were saying, we'll have to learn how to live with this. This is something that is here to stay. Uh, you know, mm, how we accommodate this, how we deal with this problem. And it took Iraq basically two and a half years to eliminate Daesh as a territorial, as a territorial power. Well, with the help of the international coalition and international support, but basically it was an Iraqi fight. So uh, what has happened there? There's been, the way it has been addressed, I think, really shows you, and I think it shows us, how uh, there are some solutions we have to learn from and not be preaching and not uh, what uh, Steve was saying. Principle pragmatism means we don't preach so much and we offer solutions. But for example, when over six million people were displaced and most of them are back, or many of them, not all of them because they're still IDPs, but are back in the, uh, their cities or in their villages without a significant amount of violence and retribution, I think that is quite remarkable. And I think our role in that was important to support stabilization, but it's mostly had been an Iraqi endeavor. When uh, Prime Minister Abadi was uh, saying that I'm not leading uh, a war against my own people, it's a war of liberation. So I think that has been important. Sometimes the international coalition was not understanding why it is taking so long to act here or there. So I think uh, that is part of what I think is the, this, this laboratory uh, that we are, we are talking about. I think there are a lot of local solutions that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to come here with the uh, magic bullet for, for a phenomenon that, that uh, partly, and I, I would like to quote uh, a Moroccan uh, media leader, a young, uh, the, the creator of actually one of the most successful radio stations, radio networks for young, young people, and he basically was saying, well, you know, what worries us about radicalism is those Moroccans coming from Europe. They're the ones coming radicalized. And that's a question for Tine, because I was a little, I mean, it became, I mean, it was very paradoxical for me to, to hear when you said that Wahhabism was used as a tool for de-radicalization, when normally it's considered to be the source and the root of radicalism. And those who have been, like me, in many countries in the region, in Egypt or even in West Africa, and you see normally funds coming from the Gulf going into uh, financing Wahhabi or, or Salafist uh, uh, preaching or missionaries that spread a very intolerant version of Islam that basically gets in, in conflict or becomes the source of conflict with the local Sufi uh, traditions, it's difficult to see how does it works, but it's certainly an interesting, I love paradoxes, so. Please. Uh, thank you, Morten, for the for the question. Is is EU more flexible in moving money around essentially to overcome the four challenges that I mentioned: effective multilateralism, uh, local ownership, conflict sensitivity, and the balance between values and interests? Maybe expect this from a lawyer, but the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, even if the European Union is often perceived 
especially in, in, in terms of development assistance funding as an oil tanker, which is very difficult to move in order to readjust to, uh, to new priorities or, uh, or circumstances, the EU is in fact very nimble and very inventive in times of crisis. And what you have seen as a result of the migration crisis, also uh, with a view to finding a solution uh, for, uh, for the refugees, uh, for the Syrian refugees um, in neighboring countries of, uh, of Syria is, is the proliferation of all kinds of trust funds, which of course are essentially donor conferences where the EU tries to coordinate in an effective multilateral way the pooling uh, and, and, and sharing of, uh, of, uh, of resources, and in as far as possible to tune this with, uh, with local ownership. Of course, that is governmental primarily and not necessarily, um, you know, do the, the NGOs or uh, civil society organizations get their full voice heard in those intergovernmental uh, conferences. Um, now, with a view to the future, the EU is in fact now proposing one big funding instrument for external action. Essentially lumping together neighborhood uh, instruments with, with all kinds of other uh, funding tools at its disposal, um, which of course would provide more nimbleness in order to respond to uh, crisis situations as they develop, but may go to uh, to the detriment, of course, longer-term planned development assistance, which is obviously uh, of the kind that uh, that uh, Cameron also referred to necessary in order to prevent uh, uh, violent extremism at uh, at a local level. So there too, the EU could open itself up to uh, to criticism in not meeting those um, those four challenges, but in fact prioritizing a fortress Europe type of approach driven by, as I mentioned before, local member state politics. Coming on. I, mean, I, uh, I do agree that the, the, the way state, states respond or act, uh, behave with other groups, I mean, can be seen as a main driver and is being validated in the literature. Uh, just uh, one definition of violent extremism is, is a group or individual who support ideologically motivated violence to further political objectives in most of the cases against the status quo, against the order, against the state. And in Iraq, actually, one of the main drivers, uh, well, there are lots of drivers, but one of the main drivers of the rise of ISIS in 2014 was the feeling of or perceived sectarian authoritarian policies of the government in Baghdad. Uh, it, it, it happens to be an actual uh, you know, indication of, of, of the government policy, but also to do a lot with feeling of, of, of perceived such a sectarian authoritarian policy. Uh, I just, uh, it's related to your uh, question, but also to Mr. Ramon. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can, I mean, different regimes in, in, in the Middle East have been able to defeat terrorism, actually. And even Assad has been able to do that. Uh, so, but the question is, uh, again, is violent extremism. Uh, we studied a lot about the IDPs and the return of the people. And in most of the cases, people returned because there was no alternative for them. There was no good condition for them to stay or to migrate. So again, I mean, it's the question of, of preventing violent extremism. Of course, hard security you know, initiative is, is a, the, the key step to, to do that. But also I'm worried about the, the, the you know, perpetuating this stabilization phase mainly uh, initiated by the state institutions. There has to be a moment that uh, we can combine the, the development and, and, and human security programs and incorporate them into stabilization phase. Thank you. Tina, you had a challenge both from me and from the ambassador, so please. 
So concerning Morocco, I think that, uh, in my opinion, the main lesson is perhaps uh, pardoning and rehabilitating uh, jihadists. Uh, the main lesson for Iraq, we see now in Iraq that there is a question what will be done with the former jihadi uh, fighters and their families. So, uh, and this is also of course a question for returnee uh, foreign fighters in Europe. So it's a, I think that both European countries and uh, Iraq, we can learn something from Morocco and Saudi Arabia about rehabilitating uh, former jihadists. That uh, is not, as we know from most countries including Lebanon, uh, uh, keeping jihadists in prison is not necessarily the good way to, uh, to uh, rehabilitate them at all. And uh, of course, um, concerning um, Saudi Arabia, the success rate was actually 80 to 90 percent of this program since it started in 2003. Um, but uh, of course it works better in a Wahhabi state or in a state where Wahhabism is state, ide state ideology, where it can be controlled, of course. Um, but, uh, and it hasn't, uh, Saudi Arabia has not exported, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, they have not exported this program. This is a program they have uh, internally. But of course, this, the approach, as I mentioned, has been changing uh, with the power centralization in the religious field in the recent years. And um, I think if we compare to Iraq, um, Wahhabism is perhaps more complicated because jihadism becomes a response to sectarian political concerns. And that's also the case in Lebanon, of course. Okay, thank you. And now I would like to open it up to, to the floor and see if you have any comments or questions. I assume there is a mic around somewhere. It'll start there, yes? And then in the back, and then there. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Do we, we take the free first, and then I take a new round? Okay, so please. Thank you. I am Hassan al Asadi from Arafidin Center for Dialogue, Specials in Politics. And my question if we look uh, to the region of the Middle East, it is easy to recognize that the undemocratic countries are very interested to extend their control and influence over the region, as Saudi Arabia did in Yemen, Iran did in Iraq, in Syria maybe, this on the regional level. On the domestic level, the Islamist power, the political power of the Islamic background are the main, are the main political player. They dominate the governments and so on. So within this level of European engagement in the region, in Iraq particularly, is there opportunity for democracy to be the ultimate political system? Could democracy survive with, with this undemocratic region? Thank you very much. Thank you. And then... Yes, uh, you are next. Um, Vladimir Vilgeberg. I had a question to the European ambassador. Um, <clears throat> the European Union has, or European member states have a policy uh, to have local prosecution of uh, ISIS foreign fighters. Um, the, do you think that this uh, poses also a risk for radicalization, for instance, for foreign fighters that are stuck then in Iraq or maybe also in Syria? Uh, how do you see that? Thank you. Thanks. And can we get the mic uh, one step further? Yes, please. سؤال لسعادة السفير فيه جانبان. الأول فيما يتعلق بكون الاتحاد الأوروبي كان المصدر الأول للإرهابيين. إرهابي داعش إلى مناطق النزاع المسلح في الشرق الأوسط لا سيما في العراق وسوريا السؤال الثاني فيما يتعلق بدعم العراق فيما يتعلق ببرامج مكافحة التطرف العنيف أعيد السؤال السؤال الأول فيما يتعلق ب معالجة الاتحاد الأوروبي كونه صدر أكبر مجموعة من الإرهابيين إلى مناطق النزاع في الشرق الأوسط لا سيما في العراق وسوريا وخاصة منذ الأصول العربية والإسلامية 
هذه كانت تشكل مشكله بالنسبه لاهالي الموصل ولجميع مناطق النزاع في الشرق الاوسط. السؤال الثاني فيما يتعلق بدعم العراق السؤال الثاني يتعلق بدعم العراق فيما يتعلق ببرامج مكافحه التطرف العنيف سواء فيما يتعلق ببرامج التحقيق او الدعم الامني او الدعم التكنولوجي، ما هي الجهود المنصبه في هذا المجال؟ We take uh, we take some uh, responses now and then we kick it back to the floor. So I already have a couple on my uh, list there. Uh, Ambassador, would you like to start? Um, sure, I can. I can mention. Well, starting with, um, I think the first question <clears throat> was basically about the the future uh, of democracy and our involvement in promoting democracy. We are known to be certainly. Uh, defending and, uh, and supporting the democratic uh, process in the region and through different initiatives, programs, our uh, cooperation initiatives, our political dialogues, um, our human rights advocacy. I think um, Iraq is a good example with all its problems, with all the flaws that the system may have, and we have gone through a lot of crisis recently ending up with the elections, the, the elections were questioned. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think there is a vibrant political process. There is a freedom of expression and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and choice in terms of uh, your political affiliation that uh, is certainly a model for the region. I think uh, we, are, we are certainly um, Supporting this, supporting this process, and I think that uh, the future of democracy in the region is is not so much in danger from, let's say, undemocratic practices. I think in or undemocratic regimes uh, in the in in the region so much as the lack of uh, political engagement. And, uh, and, and really of assuming assumption of responsibility that sometimes uh, takes place in, in, uh, in the countries and not downplaying the external influence uh, effect. But I think uh, Iraq is a good example on how surrounded by powerful countries, uh, all with hegemonic ambitions on the region, and in Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, it managed, or it has managed, to uh, play a balancing act between all of them. And uh, basically, mm, make sure that all its neighbors become somehow interested in preserving Iraq's stability. So I think um, that has been well played by the Iraqi government recently. And I think that uh, it is one of the of the successful stories that we can that we can mention. I I believe this is something that will be also continued by the next government. It's something I think is structural, and it has to do with uh, the conviction that uh, all Iraqi political leaders have that any taking sides in regional confrontations will immediately involve internal destabilization. I, in that sense, I'm optimistic about how this, this can be addressed, and I don't think Iraq will be facing a threat from being in this environment in which non-democratic systems are influential, prevalent, or, or they are big players. My worry will be more on the lack of political participation if the engagement of the, of the youth in the political process is not maintained and we have all seen how uh, abstention has become a very prominent feature in the last elections. So I think that is where probably the danger lies, not so much in, in the external influence, I think. Um, then there's a question on local prosecution. Well, we support a, a UN resolution on the crimes uh, of Daesh. Uh, this resolution respects uh, Iraq's sovereignty and uh, gives the Iraqi judiciary the main role in uh, prosecuting those crimes. 
we continued our advocacy concerning death penalty and demanding a moratorium. Uh, and I think mm, that is part of, like, let's say, our principal pragmatism uh, in the sense that we maintain these principles, but on the other hand, it is up to the Iraqi state where the crimes were committed to judge and, and prosecute them and deliver justice to the victims. Um, I think our position is, is clear on that. The UN has set up a whole uh, uh, mission to, to deal with it. We will support it. And the only thing is international cooperation, in our case, is conditioned by uh, those prosecutions do not result in death penalties. And then the third question was about uh, foreign fighters and the, and the um, uh, role that European foreign fighters had. Well, this has always been a two-way street, in the sense that uh, radical influences have moved from the region into Europe, and then from Europe into the region. Um, we have a lot of these radical preachers that have been uh, active in uh, certain neighborhoods in which immigration, unemployment, and, other, and social exclusion are a problem, taking advantage of it and radicalized uh, many, many young people from, from Arab origin. And, and this has become, again, a revolving door. Uh, I understand that there's a lot of programs now trying to address this. There's a lot of awareness on, on the effect of this. And, but we believe that at the end of the day, it will be actually here. It will be in the region where this problem is going to be, uh, or where the solution of this problem can be found. Because it is from some of these dysfunctionalities that a lot of the um, in inspiration for this radicalization takes place, partly for Western policies in the region, but very often is actually a manipulation of a cultural, religious conflict for political reasons. So I think if, if in this, the solution is not in the West, the solution is in Islam. This is a battle for the hearts and minds in the Islamic world. The, the, the worst enemy of, of uh, of uh, jihadi uh, uh, radical fighter or, uh, or, or this, this is extremist uh, uh, fanatics is a fellow Muslim. They are the main victims. They are the, because they are either Sufis or because they are either Shia or because they are either from a different persuasion or they are secular. So I think it's here where really that, that, uh, that battle is taking place. And uh, I think, and that's what my, my first argument is, it shouldn't be thought of uh, the West versus mm, the radical, radical Islamist. I think it is actually very much an, 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 internal, an internal conflict as well. So, and what we are doing? Well, I think the European Union has been since, well, for the last, uh, five, six years, one of the main donors to the stabilization in humanitarian assistance and now in uh, recovery and reconstruction. So we are, we are trying to um, now develop uh, new projects. As you know, in the Kuwait conference, the European Union was a co-chair together with Kuwait and with the, and with the UN. And, and there's been an, uh, a very uh, clear engagement and, and commitment. And uh, High Representative Federica Mogherini, that represented the European Union, uh, has pledged 400 million in, in grants, not in loans, uh, to basically address the main, the main challenges uh, that now the liberated uh, territories and and the other regions of Iraq uh, uh, have concerning reforms and addressing the root causes of conflict. Thank you. Cameron, you wanted also to address this. Yeah, I mean, the question, can democracy survive in undemocratic environment? Uh, actually, we can, we can develop local version of principle pragmatism, you know. Uh, here, I want to highlight an important issue. 
A, a strong state is a precondition to, to democracy, I believe that, but in the context of the Middle East, and especially from the Kurdish perspective, when people talk about strengthening state, they feel that they are talking about strengthening the regime. So there has to be uh, a differentiated perspective from regime security and regime strength and state strengthen. So strengthening and establishing a strong state is a precondition to democracy. Expectations about towards negative expectations towards future we found from our research funded by the Netherlands Organization for Research last year is the key driver to migration. People feel that here there is no uh, the positive perception to us. There's, people feel that there is no future. They don't have future. And again, there is no automatic solution to provide a better future. But strengthening state institutions, I believe that is the, it can be the priority to create or change the feeling or the perception of, of people in this region towards their future. Thank you. I very much agree with you, Cameron. I think that, I mean, democracy <laughs> is not necessarily under threat, but also dem democracy and democratic-minded parties and the, how do you say, the political elite of democratic-minded parties in the Middle East and in Iraq needs to show that it can deliver on this identity crisis, on this livelihood crisis. It has to show that it's relevant and can give on concrete answers to people's struggle to both make a living and make sense out of living in this region. Then it will survive. But there is also a political class that needs to get its acts together in order to that, for that to be achieved. Uh, Tine Steven, do you want to briefly comment upon this? Well, I share the, uh, the observations by, by the ambassadors, so in the interest of time, it may be better to collect extra. Then we enter into what I believe will be our final round of uh, interventions from the floor. I have two there and I have two in front here. Please can you start with, uh, start there and then work your way this way. And if anybody more wants to speak, uh, then you need to raise their hand very quickly now. And please, no long interventions. Okay, two points to Ryman. Uh, first, it's about based on some criteria, we can say that Iraq might be one of the failed states. Failed state. And uh, my question is about, my concern about EU's approach or strategy in Iraq. Is it okay for one, two years, as per the horizon for 2020, or we may need further or longer approach in Iraq? This year's second viewpoint is uh, about Kurdistan region in Iraq. You know, there's a different, significant differences in the context. In northern part of the Iraq, Kurdistan region and center. What's the idea of the EU in this year in terms of the uh, response of the emergency, in response of the sustainable development, resilience building in Kurdistan region? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please move the mic uh, to your right. Uh, Assistant Prof. Khalaf uh, al Jabouri, Head of Human Departments, College of Law, University of Mosul. Uh, both the speakers, I mean from the European Union, talked about the role of the Union in Iraq without or away from the viewpoint or the opinion of the USA and the UN. My question is, is there a coordination or cooperation between, uh, between the Union and the USA and the Union in this file? Thank you. Yes, please. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry, Mr. Cameron. I said to you that there is a difference between the development of the development and the development. أنا سؤالي هل أن العنف حينما يتطور وتتسع مساحته يقود إلى الإرهاب أم أن العنف هو شكل من أشكال الإرهاب؟ شكرا. 
نعم مكافحة الإرهاب والتطرف العنيف من مسؤولية الجميع كدول ومنظمات وأحزاب وشعوب لكن يجب أن ننظر إلى التطرف العنيف والإرهاب على أنه لا دين له ولا وطن له ولا عرق ولا قومية ولا جنسية لا يمكن أن ينسب التطرف العنيف إلى دين أو مذهب أو قومية أو عرق أو منطقة جغرافية محددة التطرف العنيف هو التفكير العنيف الإقصائي الذي لا يتحمل الآخر المصحوب بالسلوك الإجرامي هذا هو التطرف الموقف, الموقف الدولي من ثورات الشعوب التي تطالب وتنادي بالحرية بالكرامة بالعيش بالخبز كان موقفا يعني شابه كثير من التشويش وأصبح موضع تساؤلات والشكوك كثيرة نحن نرى أن الأنظمة الدكتاتورية التي تكبت صوت الشعوب تدعم هذه الأنظمة وتناصر وتساعد وتساند لكن وأنتم ذكرتم أشرتم إلى مركز محمد بن سلمان محمد بن سلمان نفسه في قضية المثارة التي عليها جدل كثير هذه الأيام يتعامل قواعد الحوار عنده أصول فض الشجار والنزاع عن طريق الخنق والمنشار هذا هو المنطق الذي يعني تعامل معه مع صحفي صاحب كلمة ينادي بالحرية ينتقد الممارسات الخاطئة للأنظمة فلا بد أن تكون الخطة شاملة تشمل الجوانب السياسية والجوانب الفكرية والثقافية والتربوية والتعليمية والاجتماعية والاقتصادية لمعالجة التطرف وأن لا يفسح أي مجال للأنظمة الشمولية التي تكبت الحريات ولا بد أن تدعم الشعوب في ثوراتها لا أن تدعم الثورات المضادة شكرا جزيلا Thank you. Uh, sorry, we are uh, on uh, soon on overtime now and see that uh, Dr. Dlaver is also nodding that I think he wants us out of there soon. Uh, so um, I'm now going to ask the panelists to uh, some either addressing some of these points that were raised or uh, any final uh, closing statement that you would like to make and we'll start very quick point uh, concerning coordination because I know it's a, it's a pressing issue. Yes, there is effective coordination uh, between the European Union, the US, the UN and all the rest of the international partners. Uh, we have several mechanisms, there are several task forces that exist and now uh, the government has just launched the executive committee for recovery, reconstruction and development that will be the ultimate um, structure in which government priorities will be discussed and the European Union, the UN and the World Bank are uh, included in this, uh, in this uh, structure. And there will be a partners forum in which all the rest of the donors will be represented. So I think Iraq probably has one of the most uh, effective and, and developed uh, coordination uh, mechanisms for uh, international assistance. Stephen, final words? Yes, uh, perhaps on the issue of, uh, of strategic orientation, which of course um, was reoriented in 2016 in, in the way already described, um, and developed, elaborated basically in a whole set of country-specific, as, as the strategy for Iraq uh, um, shows, regional, as the previous one for Iraq and Syria encountering uh, Daesh is concerned, or other regions in the world, uh, the Sahel, or uh, the Gulf of Guinea, or uh, you name it, or indeed on, on thematic issues such as um, resilience um, in particular, as, uh, as mentioned before. So, I mean, th this, this new reorientation of the European Union, which tries to balance interests um, and values is basically mainstreamed in, in all of those ways and then trickles down into programs and policies as, uh, as we can explain to you in, in more detail. Um, I think uh, there were many interesting questions here and I uh, completely agree with uh, the gentleman who mentioned the need for um, to tackle root causes and um, 
that there should be a full uh, CML program to address violent extremism and uh, edu the educational measures are of course part of this full program. So um, I think the problem is when official Islamic institutions completely lack control over their religious field as they do in Lebanon um, and to some extent in Iraq for histor historical reasons how to create then a, um, a popular Islam, how can official religious institutions become popular and credible in the eyes of the populations? I think that's a difficult question to answer. And finally. Uh, my on. final word is also an answer to the question asked to me. Uh, well, terrorism and violent extremism have many in common, but when it comes to approaches to counter and prevent them, there has to be a two different approach. Terrorism, the, the approach to address terrorism is more short-term, military, direct, and hard security. But violent extremism is the, the use of non-coercive means to, to prevent people from radicalizing towards violence. So the terrorism needs more short-term effective military solutions and the violent extremism is more long-term, more soft security. Okay, okay. with those words, uh, please join me in thanking the panelists and thank you also for being a patient and very attentive audience. The ambassador has suddenly run off, so uh, there he is again. So uh, let's also thank the ambassador for staying with us and uh, engaging.